Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki. Good to be back and uh, good to be back with our listeners. And good to be here at Hub 925 in Pleasanton. Thank you to Dre in the engineering booth making us sound amazing. That's right, as always. And uh, for the good folks at Hub who allow us to use their wonderful space. So always a pleasure. Um, but uh, yeah, we got some great feedback from our last episode. I know this is our first episode back from Eid. How was Eid for you? It it was uh, it was Eid, you know. It, it went by very quickly. It's right. interesting, you know. I mean, uh, 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 it, when it's in the middle of the week, it's it's I a know. challenge because yeah. you're navigating around work schedule and stuff. So. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah, and then it's still having to juggle. Like, okay, is it Tuesday or is it Wednesday or is it yeah, this? It messes the, you up. Yeah, it bit, really did. You know? mm-hmm. That's right. So, uh, but yeah, good to be back, and we are super excited. Yes, with our guest today. Well, and and our guest is Amir Suleiman, who is a yes. poet, recording artist. He is a Harvard Fellow, an actor, a screenwriter, and producer. He's born in Rochester, New York. His poems cross subjects of love, tragedy, as well as what it means to reconcile humanity with the unprecedented trials of modernity. Amir Suleiman, thank you so much yes, for coming uh, on. Thank you, thank you, guys. Yeah, it's such a great. Yeah, it's, I've been wanting to have you on the show forever, and. Uh, so yeah, uh, finally made it happen. So thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's great how it uh yeah. how it all happened. Uh, and and we were almost undone by bare area traffic today. So. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I had the wrong day. The traffic is crazy. Yeah, I decided to try to skip the bar to try to make it easier. Come in, that ended up being a mistake. So yeah, but. All in all, we're here. We're so here. It's good. Although not getting on the BART was probably the best decision or the best thing that happened to you today because that's not always a pleasurable ride. Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and coming. Um, it's here. sad to say. I, 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 it saddens me to say that because we are in the hub, the tech capital of the world, and yet mm-hmm. we've got BART. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's tricky. Huh? <laughs> but yes, yeah. uh, you know, even how I uh, learned about this great work that you guys are doing. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I told you how I. Uh, um, even uh, before I saw you, yeah, well, I was in Seattle, and I ran into Muhi. Okay, it was okay. It was Muhi in Seattle. I didn't know it was Seattle. That's right. Or I forgot you telling me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was crazy. And like uh-huh. one o'clock in the morning, we walk into a diner together. I haven't seen him in yeah. four years. I don't know how many years yeah. we haven't laid eyes on each other. Right. I was at a place where I I couldn't uh, get into my room at that moment. It's like one or two in the morning. I'm like, let me just go to a get something to eat, come back to the to the place where I was staying and I would be good. And uh yeah, in this twenty four hour diner in <laughs> Seattle. Right. Uh I ordered my food and the guy's like, the guy over here has paid for your dinner, don't worry about <laughs> it. I look over there. That's always movie. nice. Yeah. It's and, like out of a and, movie or something. And Muhi, of course, yeah. uh, he is with the American Muslim Fund who they sponsor us here at uh, Diffuse Congruence. So That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Mohi. Thank you, American Muslim Fund. Yeah. yeah so yeah. thank you not only for sponsoring us, but also sending guests our way. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, right. <laughs> and, double and, duty over that's, here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and no less than Amir Suleiman. So we are super excited. Yeah, um, it's my pleasure. Man. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, uh, as we often like to do, uh, sort of uh, talking about your origin story and you mm-hmm. know where you hail from, I, I, I I didn't realize you're from upstate New York, and yeah. so you grew up. You were born and raised in Rochester, like you grew up there. Yeah, in Rochester yeah. and the surrounding suburbs of yeah. Rochester. So when I was young, we moved around a lot, and so uh, I was in Rochester and another suburb called Arundelquay, and another suburb called Fairport, and another suburb called uh, Penfield. But we were all in that, mm. in that, only moving maybe. 20 minutes you know uh, in any direction in any direction but there was a lot of moving around when i was young but yeah i was born raised there until i went to north carolina to go to college oh okay okay um yeah i uh, i used to work for for a outfit that you, that was based um in rochester so uh-huh. i spent like a week there uh-huh. um uh, luckily i mean rochester is a great town and don't get me wrong i mean there's not a whole lot to do <laughs> right. um but we went to buffalo where you know there's a lot more going on in yeah. buffalo but uh yeah, that had been sort of my first foray into into uh, upstate New York, as it were. But, yeah, uh, it's a trip, man, mm-hmm. because as um, I, you know, because I started writing poetry when I was really young. Got it. Um, just for myself, I, yeah. I didn't really think of it as um, 
as an art or a skill or a talent or or anything, you know. Mm. And um, it was a place in downtown Rochester called Java Joe's. It was the only place where you could do poetry. Um, well, that I know of even to today. Uh, I haven't been back to Rochester in a long time. Everybody left. My mother left. Well, they've, you know, uh, and I was there last year, and, and it's well, one of the things that a lot of the natives there were telling me about is this kind of growing and burgeoning art scene that's uh, happening in the in downtown. Actually, interesting. kind of a lot, of, you know, gentrification, all that stuff right. that's been that, that goes along with it. But nonetheless, you know, we went to a couple of these spots, and you know, you'll have like open mic night, and or you'll uh, have like a band playing. So there's got this sort of burgeoning art music scene going on in Rochester, of all places. Yeah, I wonder. If Java Joe's is still there. Man. Yeah. I, I literally haven't been back to Rochester in like, I mean, I mean, man. Because once my mother left and my brothers left, mm. though, you know, any time that I had off or time to travel or you know for for to visit family, I would be going to either Arizona, where my mother lives, or I'd be going to uh, visit my brothers or something like that. So I haven't had a reason to go back to to. I mean, it was over ten years. Right. But um. But when you were growing up, I imagine so. I mean, again, some of our listeners may not know, but like Kodak is based there. Yeah, so Kodak so, yeah. was uh, huge there, and then actually around the you know the digital yeah, photo, that's what I'm thinking. you know, era that that folded up. Xerox was was huge. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody worked for Xerox or or Kodak, uh, basically. And um, so when those uh, suffered a blow, particularly Kodak, that really crippled the, the, the city. Yeah. And Rochester in the '90s, man, was really um, Rochester, the city proper, was really, it was a really dangerous city, man. Yeah. You know, it was one of those places that you think of like, um, like Flint, Michigan, or where it's not really that there's, it's not a major city, yeah. Um, but just per capita, there was just a lot of violence, you know. Mm. So my mother moved us out to uh, Penfield, which is a suburb, but we really couldn't afford to live in Penfield. But the schools were the best there, and she was, you know, raising three black boys in Rochester by herself. So, it, you know, the kind of keeping us out of the street was a high priority. And so we, uh, we were there in Penfield, and the only time I would really go into which is kind of a trip when I think about it, but um, that I would go into the city. I mean, we would go into the city. You know, our cousins lived there, a lot mm. of people. So it's not like we would never go into the city. But I, the Java Joe's was right downtown. Mm. And uh, and it was on a Tuesday night. And um, my mother would take me. I was still in school. You know what I'm saying? It's mm. kind of a trip when I think about it now. But uh, she would take me on Tuesday nights. And, uh, you know, I signed a list. And, and it's a trip because I would be so nervous. Mm. When I was on the mic, when it was my turn, I would be anticipating it's really how, how old were you i mean when, we when gotta we i mean performing. we're talking well at this venue yeah because i had done like other talent okay. shows and things like that but <clears throat> by the time i got there i was still very 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 new mm. and uh i mean like 14 years old 15 wow. years old like that right yeah. so i would get there and it would be people of all ages and whatnot you know and um I would get up and I would hold my paper and I would wear my cap down low so like no one could see my eyes and I would uh I would just say it so fast like mm. it was hot in my mouth I would <laughs> and then I would just run off the stage <laughs> as right. if it was the worst thing ever right. happened in my life and then I would show up the next week to do it again and then the next <laughs> week to do it again so you know that was my um my uh my early experience and it was good because you know, it wasn't just people my age uh -huh. and weren't just people from my background. And Java Joe's, even physically, where it was located in the city, you know, there'd be like older ex beatnik type poets and there'd be like young hip hop guys and there'd be this type and that type. So it was, it was a real interesting mix of folks mm. that we would have. And so me hearing that poetry at, at a young age, and me, you know, presenting myself in front of that kind of diverse audience at a young age, I think really affected my my craft. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you, you like you mentioned kind of the, I guess, for lack of a better word, way to describe it, like stage fright or whatever. But I hear that often from, and Zucky, I mean, I'm sure you can relate, but like for people who do have an artistic gift or talent, that the worst part of what they do is the is being in the spotlight, as it were. 
And you would think that's yeah. almost contradictory to is, the man. nature of the craft, as you said, or the nature of the space that you occupy. Yeah. Is I, that true? I mean, do you, do you think that's true? I mean, in terms of... I, I think it may be true mm-hmm. for... for it, it's it's yeah. interesting because... So as I started to develop, right. um, and like when I went to North Carolina, a t Greensboro, North Carolina is where I went to college. Okay. And I remember when I was leaving for college, I didn't even really want to go to college. My mother made me. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm good. I, yeah. I'm finished with school. I didn't like, I never was a good student or yeah. anything. So, but she was like, no, you have to go to college. So I went to, um, to Greensboro, North Carolina. And I remember my mother saying, you know, college, these can be the best years of your life. Cause you can just decide who you are. Like mm, these yeah. people don't know you. Right. You can just decide who you are. You're a blank slate. Yeah. yeah. Blank slate. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know, what do I want to be? And I was like, I want to be a poet. Like, I wrote poetry, but I wasn't like a yeah. poet. I didn't think yeah. of myself, or people didn't know me in that way. So the the, the, the defining characteristic that I decided that I wanted to have, uh, but just by that mind uh that that mindset mm-hmm. i started to attract because you know you meet people hey yeah. what do you do right. and i'm like yeah where can i do poetry right here i'm a poet you know what yeah. I mean? like that type of thing so uh i developed this uh you know this group this cadre yeah. uh, of of artists uh and there was a brother umar riggs who was kind of the ringleader we had this collective called the organic vibe which is a very 90s name for it <laughs> <laughs> the organic vibe that's right <laughs> but we ended up being like in the city in the surrounding area like really popular like mm. the um the barnes and nobles named a drink after us and wow. like there was like this mocha caramel thing that was called the organic I guess no, the, I guess the name you, lends itself to a, to you know, a drink. You know, you made it exactly. when yeah. Barnes & Noble. Exactly, that's, exactly. That's that, a bucket list thing, I think. Exactly, you know. So I was like, yeah. uh, you know, something to call home about. Like, right. Mama, we got we to gotta drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but so I would, uh, we would do these events. And it's, it's strange because when I was presenting, once I got to that, that level, after I got over the initial just stage fright, the only sweet spot would be the actual moment of the presentation. Everything leading up to it, including walking onto the stage yeah. and particularly walking off of the stage. Mm-hmm. I would fantasize. I would be doing my thing and I would fantasize about just a door opening up under. And, just, and yeah. I would just, as soon as I said the last word, I would just disappear. Wow. Because it's kind of a traveling between two worlds. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you come, when I would come back from the world where the, poem was i know this sounds super um uh esoteric and super whatever but yeah. it's it's, it's, it's no, what deep. happens yeah, yeah 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 and um especially some of my more intense poems right it's like i i i travel to where that poem is hmm. and then i have to come back and then people want to come and shake your hand and talk and yeah. and i'm not mentally prepared That's psychologically cool. prepared emotionally prepared to deal with that so <laughs> i would recite the poem and as soon as i said my last word i would literally walk out of the building Mm. so i would say you know such and such such and such and the end and i would walk straight to the front door and walk out of the building amir Suleiman has left the building (laughs) that was my thing and after about 45 minutes or an hour i would be able to come back um and then i learned how to do it in like 30 minutes and then i learned how to do it in like 20 minutes and so on and so forth so now i'm at the point where i can generally speaking you know, engage that part of myself and come back to be a normal human being pretty efficiently now, better than I did when I was 18. Yeah. What was it about poetry, say, unlike any other art- artistic expression that attracted you to that as a way to express yourself? Yeah, um, when I first started, like I said, I started when I was really young. And um, that wasn't really a decision. I wasn't, mm-hmm. well, I was drawing and painting as well. Uh-huh. Um, so I was doing that very seriously. Uh, I mean, for a kid, I was doing it. I would be drawing and painting every day. And I entered some competitions and won some competitions and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it was a, it was a, a serious uh, part of my life. Um, but um, the, uh, I found a, a limitation in the visual arts, which is actually something I'm starting to get back into now, uh, visual arts. Mm. But um, at that point, I felt a certain limitation in visual arts, like my skill to express myself with 
uh, like a pencil or a paintbrush wasn't as capable as my ability to express myself with language. I just had more of a capacity with language. And um, and then when, you know, certain albums that I heard that really transformed me. So, you know, when I heard like early Nas, like Nas Illmatic and, and that, that era, when I heard... Uh, Lauren Hill's verses on the score on the Fuji's album, I was like, this is mm. amazing. Black Thought, Illadelph Half-Life was really transformative. And it was just that these artists that were so agile and so sophisticated and so, um, you know, Nas with his with his imagery and his, a bit, his storytelling, it was so advanced. Mm. And I was like, he would be saying words and I would be seeing movies, you know, I would be seeing cinema, you know, hmm. and I was like, man, it, it was like magic. Um, and, and it was also, um, uh, like infuriating because like I would listen to Lauren Hill and I was like, she has the same words that I have. Like she has the same alphabet that I have. Right. The same like, toolkit. Yeah. But look what she's putting look what together. She's doing. Yeah. So then it made me, um, <laughs> push forward aggressively uh in my own uh capacity so i would challenge myself um in in different ways and i really honed my my craft in, in that mm. chapter that that my er, the early uh, earliest part of my craft um when i started sharing more so when i was at North Carolina a and I would be doing poetry events, but I was also do like hip hop ciphers outside of the cafeteria and stuff like that. So freestyling and battling and and poetry sessions, that was all a part of the same life, right. you know? So it, it that competitive um, element and that, that essentially hip hop element uh, or root really of my poetry informed uh, how I pushed myself in my, in my craft. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, I think of you, like, so Zucky, um, like, I know you kind of start, I mean, like now you do reviews and, and kind of wordsmithing is, is kind of your thing. But I think when you were, when you were a child, I mean, it was also, art, you know, expressing yourself through your own drawings. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I I've was, seen some of your stuff, so I know. I, I, mean, I was, I was known for my drawing mm. and I started writing to be like, look, I mean, it's weird how how your mentality works when you're a kid. But I was like, I'm more than just a an an, an artist. I can write too. And then now people are like, oh, you draw? That's that's nice. And they kind of pat you on the head a little bit, right? Uh, because I went so fully in that direction that I completely neglected my the the visual side, you know. Yeah, but uh, but I mean, just what you're describing. I mean, that it certainly speaks to me. This idea of reading what somebody else has written or hearing what somebody else says and being like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. yeah. How is, I mean, that's me with Roger Ebert. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I could read something he wrote and I'm like, that is magic. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, man, because, you know, as, uh, you know, hip hop and things, you know, hip hop makes up words all the time, <laughs> but we, you know, we don't make up letters, you know, yeah. it's like, it's 26 letters. And with those letters recited, depending on the sequence in which you recite them, you right. make a person cry or laugh or feel angry or feel seen or held or uh, console someone or uh, expand someone's mind to think about something their mind has never ventured to think about. Uh, with 26 letters, it is, uh, you know, you know, they say, you know, the word spell as in magic spell or spelling that that it's a kind of magic, you know mm. what I mean? And mm. and there's even a hadith about um, you know, that it's a it's a kind of uh magic, of right. course, depending on what, what a person is using it for. Right. Um, but as we can see very commonly, you know, that with language people are pulled into all kinds of directions, you know. That's right. But uh that um the ability to be in other cultures well, I can't say that. I was gonna say other there's there's other cultures that honor that more hmm. than our culture, where poetry is yeah. held to you know a very high regard. And in America, it's it's primarily like um, academic, like people that are you know um, it's like a scholastic poetry, mm. you know uh, that are serious poets or 
people that came from like my tradition of uh, of like hip hop tradition <clears throat> of of poets. But um, that's a good point that you raise about not only poets being held to a you know uh, held up or you know w- uh, enjoying a certain status in other cultures, mm-hmm. but the very art of poetry or the very yeah. expression of poetry being seen as the uh, apotheosis or the epitome of that culture, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, again, being from the subcontinent, you know, like uh, Urdu poetry or poetry, you know, even I would imagine Hindi poetry, but Urdu poetry, you know, that expression, and if you're versed in the ability to to, to express yourself through Urdu poetry, that's that means you've mastered the language. Right, right. And that's a, yeah. that's a, and that's a big honor. And that's why it's... Um, Interesting because what I found, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to Cornerstone folklore yeah, and we'll traveling sure. uh, around engaging poets, but in many other culture, in most cultures that I find, what's interesting, most cultures across the equator and south, the the global south as they call it, mm. um, there's a high value placed on eloquence, and poetry specifically, but the ability with language you That's know so it's really really important like I, I talked to i was talking with uh what canaan uh, you know um somali and somalia is um known for their uh poets i mean it's a, it's a major 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 part of their culture and you know uh canaan is a somali poet and, and rapper and producer and singer and, and all around great human being our good brother canaan i remember he was um talking to me about uh some of the new family members that came from Somalia to America, to Toronto, where he was, or they went to visit. I can't remember. But anyway, some people from the the quote old country were mixing with some people from the new country. And one of the boys from the, uh, from the old country, from Somalia were asking like, is something wrong with this kid? They thought he was like mentally Mm -hmm. um, deficient somehow. Um, because of the way that he spoke, you mm-hmm. know, because they're used to even the youth speaking oh, wow. in proverbs right. and, and poetry <laughs> and like, you know, and this kid was talking like, you know, but even to outside of poetry, but language in general, you'll notice that even in our political sphere, eloquence is kind of seen as being pretentious. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the more what they call quote unquote common, but yeah. I don't think it's necessarily common because, you know, pr- particularly, you know, our president now, right. I, was I just mean, about to say. speaks at a level yeah. that's, uh, I, I, I mean, it's a fourth it's, grade level. Yeah. I yes. Think, it's, I, I it's think, subcommon. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think that's a biased thing from me. I think just literally <laughs> no, if we no, were no, looking in a very that's objective, just objective. Yeah. 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 Like he, the language, his vocabulary and his ability with grammar and his sophistication with expressing uh, difficult ideas, it, you know, but that's not only not held against him from his base, but that is what, yeah, he's like a, it's not the bug, it's the he, feature. He like, tells it, he tells it like it right, is. Right, right. Yeah. That's seen as a virtue. Right. Um, the, the, yeah. the, um, yeah, the reduction of the sophistication of the language is like, that's a virtue. That's and, praiseworthy. Yeah, laudable. It's very strange. It is and very I, strange. And I think it's something about l- literate cultures. I think that the mm. earlier that the people adopted written language, the language begins to decay from that point. That's a mm. fascinating Be- point. Wow. Because you think about like the Bedouins, even in Arab culture, you know, that it was commonplace, even for the domestic, like the Meccans would send their children yeah. to the Bedouins That's right. to their sophistication in language and like... If you truly wanted to master the language, you went and studied or or were you spent time with the Bedouins. Yeah. Imam Shafi, you know, the Prophet. That's it. So I said that's that it. So yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm. That's right. And the Prophet was known as Afsahul Arab. Like yeah. he was the most eloquent of the Arabs. Yeah. Right? And, so and he would likewise yeah. laud these, you know, these people who were generally Correct. illiterate people as the most eloquent of, of, of the people. That's so true. And I don't know exactly what the relationship, why that is, yeah, but something about writing. Which he praised as well. You know, he would, the, the the premium that he placed on being able to read and write was high as well. So obviously we're not yeah. anti-literacy. <laughs> um, but something about cultures, but also what we see happening with, what we see happen with language is once it's written, it starts to reduce itself. And now we just like speaking emojis, you know, where <laughs> if the language, so you know, first it's like, LOL and BRB and, you know, and then it keeps reducing, keeps reducing, keeps reducing until it's just... 
an image, you yeah. know, mm. uh, a hieroglyph, uh, so to speak, you know. So true. Uh, yeah, and, um, and yeah, I mean, they are hieroglyphs. I mean, it's it's. You know, we we look at ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and we're sort of intuiting, well, this must mean this and they must be. And I'm kind of like thousands of years from now, what are people going <laughs> to exactly, look look at a exactly. string of emojis? Right. And there is going to be academic study devoted to <laughs> yeah. trying to divine the meaning of this, you know, what's God. going through people's heads. I, I pity them already. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. How wow. horribly wrong they're going to get all of this. <laughs> correct, right. correct. Yeah, that eggplant is not about weakness. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I, yeah, I pity them already, man. Seriously. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, so uh, for myself, and this is one of the things I love about hip-hop because yeah. it is an art form that still places a high premium on language and ability with language. So even, you know, say even in in, in our communities, say you didn't have money to dress very well mm-hmm. or, you know, your haircut wasn't all that or you weren't so handsome, or you couldn't play basketball. But if you had language, mm. that could carry you. And the girls would like you, and you would have mm. friends. If you could articulate well, and particularly in an impromptu setting where you just off of off the top of your head, you start to right. you know to present uh, language. Right. And uh, and so the 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 minds of not just the one the reciters, but the listeners, they've developed an ear to tell the difference between someone who is skilled and someone who is unskilled. That's true. And and so I, I, that that does something. And I, I'm not even quite sure what yet. You know, I, it's right. one of the things I'm curious about in general. Like, how has that developed the culture and the actual brains mm. of people that engage? Hip hop, right? Um, because you know, if you listen to Whitney Houston or you're listening to Smokey Robinson, the language may be good, but you can't. The language kind of takes a back seat to the, the how the emotion is expressed with the the tonal, Correct. you know, expression. Mm-hmm. Um, but with hip hop, and of course, some hip hop is just stupid, but that's you know, that's it's always some element of that. But there's always an element of high lyrical. Uh, sophistication, you and know, prowess. and, and yet, yeah, prowess. yet, I think when you refer to that element that that uh, is stupid, as you said, the problem is that uh, the that genre gets painted in a with a very broad, broad brush. Definitely, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's you know, when you say genre, you mean like hip hop in mean, general, oh, I mean, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So everything that's involved, especially as it grows and evolves, there's there's you know the 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 gamut you know, of levels of sophistication and nuance and whatnot. But there's always <clears throat> in hip hop been, you know, an element that's just, you don't have to think about it. It's just to party to, or it's just a vibe to, or I just like the feeling of it. Uh, but there's always a part of hip hop that is that preserved category, hmm. you know, of hip hop. So we have people like Lil Pump and stuff like that, where it's like, you know, there's no... Value and, and or sophistication and language, but we always. I don't have, even know who that is, but just you mentioning the name, <laughs> like I, I already have this. You know, what I, mean? I know exactly, exactly what you're referring to. Lil Pump is That's exactly what you think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 right, right, right. So, uh, but we always have J Cole and Kendrick, yeah. and and it's not just that these people are sidelined. So b- both of these are platinum selling artists. You know, yeah. so there's there's a there's a space and a culture for all of that. Um, and and the point is that the culture is always honored along with even like in my day. So, you know, when I was young we had like um like digital underground and the Humpty Dance or whatever. That wasn't like sophisticated right. poetry. Right. It wasn't like deeply meaningful in my life. It was goofy and it was funny and we vibed to it, you know what right. I mean? Um but <clears throat> um for uh uh, but also at that time we had, you know, the black thoughts and the public yeah. enemies and the KRS ones and we have the J. Coles and the Kendricks and all of that. And so, so true. W- we've never as a culture, hip hop, never left off honoring those people yeah. who have that that level of skill with language. Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. Um I think we'd be because I, I want to come back to this conversation, but I think we'd be remiss not to um kind of talk about like in terms of your um you know, um your I mean, your relationship with Islam. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you were you born into the faith? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. My so. mother and my father. So they converted. Well, from the Nation of Islam, uh-huh. um, about uh, with Imam Awardee Muhammad. So about three years before I was uh, born. Hmm. 
Okay. So I was I was uh, I was born into Islam. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. So and they they, they had already left the nation by the time you were born. They that's were, correct. They had left about, with the community about, of Imam Wardi and Muhammad, a lot of mercy on him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah. and actually, technically, it was really at that point the nation of Islam was under Imam Wardi Muhammad. Even the way I'm describing it yeah. uh, is, is a little historically incorrect, but it's a common mistake that we make when we talk about it. Because it wasn't like he left. He That's was, yeah. you know, the head of the Nation of Islam. And then some people left That's because right. of the direction that he took it. That's so and true. so, um, so yeah, so my parents were part of that great um, migration hmm. um and engaging the Quran at a, at a deeper mm. at a deeper level under the the leadership of a man worthy Muhammad. So in, in, you know, in that telling of the story, and I think that's important because then, you know, then uh, uh, Minister Farrakhan kind of becomes the Khairajite, right? right? He leaves, he, he right, leaves, right, yeah. right, right, <laughs> as opposed to you know Imam Muhammadin, you know, leaving. Yeah, that's leaving. a great point. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we that has come up on on you know with with previous guests we've had, and I think it's a very important nuance to make. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to date yourself, but I mean, I think generally speaking, we kind of get an idea of, of when you were born or whatever, just based on that kind of historical trajectory. Yeah, no problem. Um, so you, you kind of, so you, so you grew up in the faith. Um, um, and so I guess then, you know, and we've talked about this like with Brother Ali, uh, with um, um, Dr. Suad, who we had recently on the show. Oh, that's nice. This relationship between, I think, hip hop uh, um, and even in, in your case, like spoken word poetry uh, and, and Islam. Historically, mm -hmm. yeah, there has always been a nexus. Yeah, and you know, it's it's funny because in the '90s, um, there were more attempts at developing like a, a Muslim hip hop, Islamic hip hop, or some version of that, hmm. which didn't really work because it was kind of unnecessary. So true. And um, and, and 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 I mean, I want to name really some of these names, not for the sake of calling them out, but mm -hmm. but like like you're referring more to say um what's the group like mina raps or that became native dean mm -hmm, that kind mm -hmm. of that that push in the 90s it was very much in the yeah 90s. so it was, it was them and there were there were a no, bunch others. of other yeah right, a bunch right. of other groups in that um and i think that came i, I and i understand the motivation for it, and i appreciate the motivation for it um like one of the um one of the brothers more recently uh, these young brothers, uh, Dean Squad, who do a oh, lot yeah, of remixes Squad, right. and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I get it, and they serve like a community, they serve a, a, an audience that really appreciates what they do, and right. that's and that's and that's great. Um, the thing is, um, Muslim hip hop, uh, quote unquote, it's just hip hop, meaning Islam has been a part of hip hop from the beginning. Right. Um, now you might have to use the adjective like Buddhist hip hop, like you would have to make that a new genre because mm. it's not there from the beginning. Mm. Or you may have okay. to say, you know, Taoist hip hop, or right. you may have to say, you know, wh whatever other adjectives. Evangelical, but, whatever, right. even Christianity. Yeah, like, yeah, even, definitely. Evangel if you wanted to use that as a platform to evangelize. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, but uh, Islam, Islam uh, and Christianity, for that right, matter, are, right. are in, the, in the origin of hip hop such that if someone wanted to talk about the Quran or talk about Ramadan or talk about the Prophet Muhammad or talk about, That's right. you know, any of those things, you know, this goes back to African Bambada. So it, it's not like a split from the genre, from the, from the, from the, from the main body of the, right. of the art form. And so the only reason I'm mentioning this, this push in the nineties is it, although it was like people wanting hip Islam to be incorporated into hip hop <clears throat> by separating themselves uh, it kind of had the opposite effect. Yeah. By putting that adjective on it, it's like, oh, you've, oh, you're not a part of this, and you're kind of trying to get into it. You know mm. what I mean? Um, instead of saying, this is, you know, we're at home here, and this is what we feel like talking about. You know. That's right. So, I never much went the route of trying to be uh, a Muslim artist in that way, right. um, where I'm a, a, a genre of a separate genre from the main body of hip hop. But in the main body of hip hop, I made my space. And that's what hip hop really requires. It requires a certain level of audacity mm -hmm. to make your space and to to speak your truth in in its center. And 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 by that, because hip hop encourages that, it, it continues to expand. Right. So you can have everything from an NWA to a Drake to a Lil Pump to a you know you there's to a MF Doom to you know so uh, these over time some people may begin to. Um, categorize these people 
you know, these groups saying, oh, this is whatever, conscious hip hop, or this yeah. is this or that, whatever. But the artists themselves, yeah. they just engaging the main body of, of hip hop and force hip hop to expand to make space for them instead of creating like a colony yeah. of hip hop and saying, we're going to try to enter into hip hop. I think that's why. Um, except in 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 the in the in the in the audience that they're directly serving, uh, why it's never really been absorbed into the main body That's of hip hop because they have to, you know, you have to, you have to make your case. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In the in the in the in the in the city square of hip hop right. uh, to to really be accepted and respected. No, I think that raises a fascinating point because I think I mean what you're identifying and and again you know we've gone into sort of the history and the, and and the major players. Uh, with like Brother Ali and others, and so we don't need to necessarily revisit that. But what I find fascinating with what you're saying is Islam was already in the vernacular of hip-hop. That's right. mm-hmm. And so you didn't have to, like, I mean, you had PRT talking about, you know, Allah and naming Allah or the Prophet Muhammad, like you said, mm-hmm. or they would sample like lectures from Malcolm, or I've even heard like sampling from like Imam Siraj or, you know, and so you had that, that was part yeah. of the vernacular. Yeah, yeah, it's part of, many people, I mean, there's many people that the first time they heard about Islam was from hip hop, and many, many people in the Bay that we know, oh, you know, yeah. like uh, Sheikh Yahya Rodis, um, you know, Imam Sweeb, Web, um, um, you know, Andisa Benjoko, uh, yeah. you know, you could name off people that after that read a book, read the autobiography of Malcolm right. X, went to Tareem, sat with Habib Omar, such and such, came back, started, a, you know, like people that we really benefit from. That their first access point. That's right. It wasn't uh, a die. You know, yeah. it wasn't a a, a a a a person. You know, calling people to Islam with pamphlets Correct. in the downtown or something like that. <laughs> right. Or it wasn't um, a family member who was Muslim. Often, oftentimes, uh, it was uh, by the gate of hip hop. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And <clears throat> excuse me. And even in that. Uh, and and then it spread among these people. So when we're thinking about yeah these people, mm-hmm. you know, Usama, his brother Anas, who was one of the oh, the, yeah. the, the main people that began to, to 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 spread it in in his community here in in the Bay, and you know, but a, a lot of that was inf- it was in, informed you know mm-hmm. by their inspir- their engagement with hip hop mm-hmm. yeah for sure without mm-hmm. a doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. It's funny because you would never you know no one looks at Yahya Rodis and like. <laughs> You know, and and that's the unfortunate thing. You know, um, and it's not it's no no fault of his. No, right. But it's um, although this is the 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 spark, the 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 light seems so distant from the spark when it's when it's not really. You know, mm, so who Yahya Rodis is, Sheikh Yahya Rodis is, and the way that he benefits people and what he's learned and the great company that he's kept and and all of that, people think it's a far distance between him and hip-hop, hip-hop you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Even, I don't know if he listens to hip-hop today or whatever, but people think of that as two totally separate worlds. So true. When they're, when they're not, they're mm-hmm. so deeply related. I, ho- I hope he doesn't mind I'm putting him on blast <laughs> like this. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, man. <laughs> Whenever we do have him on the show, we will definitely revisit that. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, we haven't had it, uh, the... the, 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 the uh, fortune of having him on the show, the uh, honor of having him on the show, and we will. Um, so, yeah, no, I, yeah, but you're right. I mean, that that is true, that in just the way people, and, and maybe that has to do with, I mean, the way, and we've talked about this in, on other, in, in, you know, in, in, on previous episodes where the relationship between Islam, quote unquote, orthodox Islam, and the and art in general has always sort of, been this there, there's been this tension yeah. that's always existed yeah. even you know uh even though we have in our tradition like you mentioned i mean the prophet praising poets certain certain also, poets mm-hmm. and 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 poetry has always been a part of and the aesthetics has always been a, a part of our tradition yet that tension has always existed yeah and it's something that's unique um right well i i think unique to the west um because when, Again, yeah, yeah. when we're talking the equator and, and, and below, okay, the poets, and like the poets and the imams and the religious people mm. and the dervishes, and the, like that's all one community. There's that's no yeah. friction. The problem is, and it really comes down to race, is really what the issue is, is that when someone from that part of the world comes here and sees hip-hop, they don't see like their 
poetry tradition. Yeah. They see it as something to defend themselves and their children from because this is the way of secularization or apostasy. You know what I mean? So mm. if your son or daughter gets into hip hop culture, mm -hmm. they're going to go astray. Okay. So you have to protect your children yeah, yeah. from hip hop. This is the westernization that everyone, every you know, brown parent from every part of the world is terrified of, you know, <laughs> that they're, they, they themselves or their children will be westernized and hip hop yeah. represents a big part of that. And that's not just the West, like rock and roll, but it's like the black West, which is like the scariest part of the American experience for your children to be, mm. you know, adopting. So, um, so they write off that yeah. whole, it's not only is it highly reductive of mm -hmm. the, of the art form, right. which is hip hop, but yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah. what happened is black American people start, it's in a way, it's okay for these other people to think that because they don't know. There's not a way for right. you to have that. You don't know what NWA really means. Like mm. it's just gangsterism. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's true. But, you know, for someone like me, it's also, you know, of the police and things like that. You, yeah. There's a there's a cultural context that you understand that no one is expecting someone to come from somewhere else and right. understand what that means. Right. 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 The 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 problem that happened, it's really, really an unfortunate, tragic problem that happened, is black American people began to adopt the minds of these other people and pretend that they don't understand what this is about. Mm. So then once the quote unquote traditional Islam began to spread, like for example, in the Warthi, uh, me being raised in the Warthi Muhammad community, I never even heard of people thinking that music was haram. I mm. literally had never yeah. even heard it before. Right. Huh. Until I came uh, to California and I started to engage with the, you it, know, the traditional, yeah, it's yeah. not, I had never even heard a person say that before. Wow. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, it was just about if the music lends itself to goodness then it's good if the if it's co a corrupting agent yeah. then it's bad that's right. it was very simple um there was no classes about it there was no debates it was in a controversial matter i never heard two people talk about it right ever mm -hmm. right for any length of time so when i came here and then and this is what created what black people were doing with like muslim hip-hop because they separated themselves right um, when it was unnecessary for them to do it, but they felt because of the influence of, quote, I don't like using this term traditional Islam in this way because I'm not like advocating for deviant Islam per se. <laughs> right. But, you know, or even if you use the term immigrant Islam, that's not to say that you're immigrant bashing, right, bashing right, either. Right, right. But these are terms we have to use. Right. So, for, for, for lack of better correct, terminology correct. at this point. Right. And so when, but people like, say, for example, most deaf did not fall into that. Yasin Bey did not fall into that. Or, you know, several influential people didn't fall in and you see their influence on the culture is because they accepted that this is a part of who they are. Lupe. Right, what? Lupe, yeah. you know, different people like this. And there were people that sought to, out of a feeling of religiosity, separate themselves. Yeah. But listen, this is what I'm saying, really. And this is really an unfortunate fact. But there's still time, inshallah ta'ala, unless, you know the John and Mamati are on the way today. <laughs> right. There's still a little time for uh, -huh. uh for, for for the this. end times. Yeah, yeah, for 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 this is what I'm about to mention here. Please. Um black American people develop the most consistently powerful cultural material out of any people in the world, which is really interesting wow. because we're yeah. such a small percentage of the world population and only 12% of the American population, 13% right. American population, but that we create and export the blues, create and export gospel, create and export rock and roll, create and export jazz, create and export hip hop, mm -hmm. genres that is, as far as um, musically and culturally dominated the world. There's no other people on the planet right. earth that in one, two, three generations develop that type of dominant cultural contribution so, to the world. No, right. no, no other people, no tribe of people on the planet earth. Mm. No, sorry. I, I, what I find fascinating with that comment is is it's that race is a part of it, but you're talking about a, like a cultural phenomenon, phenomenon right? Because yeah. you're not saying all black people or all it's like this is an African thing or a black thing in general. You're 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 qualifying it 
black American yeah. production, like cultural production. Yeah. So, the then, people, so that's a cultural movement. The people of Ghana, for example, who yeah. obviously have made great contributions, right. but it's not like there's three, four, five genres of Ghanaian music that's yeah. everywhere on the planet Earth. Yeah, right. hmm. There's not like uh, the, the Japanese or the Italian who great contributions to right. fashion and engineering mm-hmm. and uh, automobiles and, you know, all of that. But they haven't developed a cultural product. That's right. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe opera, maybe, you know, but for a, for a culture and one, two, three generations oh, yeah. to develop rock and roll, totally dominant, jazz, blues, hip hop, and so on, right? So by the time the Muslims, by the time black people accept Islam, that should be a moment for an explosion. Like, Casida and... um you know, we have like Mahalia Jackson and like people that sang for Jesus. I mean, world renowned mm-hmm. cultural production mm-hmm. in that space. Right. Um, and for that reason. But, and it's also common to praise the prophets of some in song and poetry yeah. everywhere along the equator and below. Very common. That's right. right. Um, uh, um, yeah, just extremely uh, common. Right? Correct. I mean, yeah, it, 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 frowning upon that is actually the anomaly. The right, norm exactly. is that people have always sung the praises of the prophet, uh, have always celebrated, for example, the maulid or whatever. That's the normative practice. And, exactly. and I don't, I mean, yeah, the numbers prove the prove the fact. But exactly. anyway, sorry. And so yeah. that, and, and anywhere Islam came, mm-hmm. they developed that. So Islam comes to black American people, mm. but because of, a, a racial inferiority that th- it was presented to black people in a way that you have to divorce yourself from your blackness to really become a real Muslim. Mm. So you need to become more either Ghanaian or Senegalese mm. or Yemeni or Pakistani or Arab or right. whatever it is, right? What someone like Dr. Jackson would call like a commit cultural apostasy. That's it. Right. And, that, and that's essential. It's mm. that's a that's a part of your religion. So you have to eat quote unquote Muslim food and you have to wear quote unquote Muslim dress and yeah. so on, right? right? And it's been a lot of particularly with Dr. Jackson, a lot of, you know, discussion ar- ar- around that. Correct. Um but what that did for our cultural that by now we would have listen. By now, if it was not for that, and mashallah, Allah does what He wills. Uh, so I don't like to say woulda, coulda, shoulda, but for the sake of what we're saying here, right, right, that if that block wasn't there, we would be producing Islamic music and cultural production that people would travel from Germany and Austria and Sweden to come to our mountain in America. There's people that come to gospel. Um, a pre- you know the what is it the, the five blind boys of Mississippi or something I can't remember the name of the band uh-huh. but they're invited all over the world you right. know to 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 sing this this blues gospel you know yeah. that people would come like the way people love church music and all of our favorite um, R and B artists yeah. the Beyonces and everybody of the world all of them learned in the church that's all we could have developed something. Along like, those lines. Along right. those lines. Mm-hmm. And what would that do for Dawah? Mm-hmm. What would that That's do right. for the spreading of the name of God? Hmm. But, you know, but like I said, yeah. maybe we still have time, you know. Yeah. So there was a little bit of anemia. I think, like you said, a little bit of anemia there. Mm-hmm. But I think, or, you know, because of that kind of impulse that arose in the community. Um, but I think that with the new generation especially, I think, you know, we're, we're getting, Yeah, I, like I believe said. that. I be- yeah. I'm very optimistic, and I mm-hmm. should say that because mm-hmm. I sound a- like... <laughs> No, 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 yeah. not at all. But I, yeah, I'm very optimistic. What people like Dr. Jackson, what people like Ubaidullah mm-hmm. Evans, what people um, and and artists, you know, um, that we have that that come from the black experience, like Brother Ali and mm-hmm. others that and they are and as a student of Dr. Omar and and these other teachers and scholars that are quote traditional Islam that's right um, but aren't um, thrown off by this racial racial issue and are in, not only accepting but encouraging mm-hmm. their students to engage in their natural way because yeah. every other people on the planet earth have been afforded that other other all the other Muslim communities in the world have that's been right. uh, uh, afforded that you that's know? right that's right so you kind of have like now the imprimatur of like traditional Islam or religious 
uh, orthodoxy that now says, okay, you know what, this is this is good. This yeah. is culture. Is, you know, like, for example, yeah. last time we were here at mm-hmm. Hub 25, it was myself and, and Sheikh Hamza. Hamza. Yeah. 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 And, um, I, I, do, I, I wanted to mention that story because as an audience member sitting there, um, and I think, it's, I mean, to my understanding, that was probably the first time Sheikh Hamza ever heard you. We, it was one time before that, but okay. it was like 2004. Oh, it was wow. a long time ago. Okay, okay. Right. Long time ago. But I remember, so, so you performed, or you spoke and then you performed a piece, and, and we'd be remiss not to have you say some, you know, perform something or share a few lines of verse for, for us uh, before we end. But um, I just remember Sheikh Hamza's, like, I just kept looking at you and then Sheikh Hamza, like you and Sheikh Hamza. <laughs> and then Sheikh Hamza gets up and talks, and he's almost like sort of, He's almost speechless. He's, he was almost like rendered speechless. I'm not huh. kidding you, uh, Zaki. And and I think he, the first five whatever minutes of his introduction was just t- sort of talking about what he felt and experienced listening to Amir. It was, mm-hmm. it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah my sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but you were gonna say something about that. Yeah. You no, know, it was just those yeah. moments, you know. Yeah. Uh, for the art- artist, but also for the audience, you know, because there might be some kid in there That's that right. has, and he says, "Man, I remember when I was seven years old and I went to that thing, and Sheikh Hamza was like this about this poet guy." So true. And so, um, not that it makes this person feel forced to enter into that, but that feel okay with it. That's you know, right. that this is right. a part of, you know, and that was part of what Sheikh Hamza was saying. Like, this is part of our tradition, and right. this is, you know, and started. You know, as as Sheikh Hamza does, start referencing these, you know, um, historical figures and and, and these different um, styles of of using language and so on. And um, and the more that we can do that, I think the better. Everyone wins. Everyone benefits, you know, from it. Yeah, that's right. No, no, I mean, mean, growing up in America, I mean, and very much growing up and coming of age in, quote unquote, 90s Islam in America – um, it would have been great to hear that yeah. as a child, yeah. or just to see that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I was going to share a story, and, and I'm not going to name names, but I mean, you know, for example, and this happened much, much later in life, but I remember reflecting on it as I'm doing right now. Is me attending a Cat Stevens concert, mm-hmm. Yusuf Islam, Cat Stevens, whatever, like in recent years, and in attendance, and I'm, again, I'm not going to name names, but there were certain quote unquote. People, scholars of high regard in our community who were in attendance. And that just, even though here I am, I was like a, I was a grown man in my 30s. I've got kids of my own now. It, it, there was that sense of like, you know what? This is all right. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is all right. I'm, I'm enjoying this music. I'm enjoying this experience. And I'm sharing it with the likes of right, whoever. Right. And that just, it, yeah, I mean... I don't know what that says about me, maybe more than anything else, no, but no. I think there is a certain... Yeah, if, we, if well, we look up to these people and this is the ideological leadership um, that a person is taking and seeing right. them engaging and it, yeah, it just, it loosens the heart and it's mm. like, oh, okay, it's okay that I like this. Like I, I was joking with someone, I said, you know, I, I learned, you know, you could learn the fic of wudu from that scholar, but I learned like the fic of attending a music concert <laughs> from him just <laughs> right. by observing right, right, right. the way he was carrying himself. <laughs> right, um, right. You were going to say something, Zaki, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 uh, you, you covered yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, yeah, so so before we close out, and I mean, we, I really want you to talk about the uh, like your current project because I think mm-hmm. it's so exciting. Um, we saw a, a, a trailer for it. Uh, we we hosted you at Talif uh, maybe what three four months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'd love for you to talk about that and, yeah, so, and your travels. Yeah, so cornerstone folklore. Actually, there's two. two actually, sorry, I, oh. sorry, did, didn't mean to cut. But I, I I think I want you to also because the first time you sort of come on my radar is not so much seeing you live here in the Bay, but um, uh, your, the, you know, the, the work you did with HBO. Oh, right, right. So you, I would, yeah, and that kind of goes <laughs> yeah. back in time. So let's touch on HBO and um, uh, Russell Slimmons and the work you were doing. Yeah, with the and actually deaf, it's, it's really poetry. connected. Yeah, okay. it's really connected because yeah. um, so 2004, 2005 uh, did the show HBO Deaf Poetry with yeah. Russell Simmons and um, – and that was a big deal for Was it Deaf Poetry Jam or was it just a Deaf Poetry? I don't I, yeah, I remember. Deaf Poetry it. Jam. Yes. Deaf, Deaf po- when yeah. was that? That was like in the ninety yeah, late nineties? No, no, it was in oh. the early two thousand. So Got I it. was I think it started two thousand or two thousand and one. Do you remember that, Zucky? Like Deaf Poetry? No. Vaguely. On on HBO. Vaguely. Oh, okay. And then it went to like two thousand and five or yeah. two thousand and six. Okay. So um, I was invited uh, to come and perform on this show, which is basically set up like the deaf comedy jam as well, you know. Right. And uh, there was a which deaf was a poetry. precursor to right. the poetry deaf, jam. Deaf comedy jam was first. That's right. Uh, and that was the nineties. And so that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
And that was a big deal for us because as a poet, there's not really a poetry industry, right. so to speak. Like no one even uses that terminology. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a comedy industry, a music industry, a movie industry, and there's so there's a there's a there's a way to climb up the ladder of That's success, true. so to speak. So like if you're a comic, you know, like say like our good brother Mar Armor or right. or As Hearts, like, you know, you do open mics and then you uh, become like maybe a regular at an open mic right. and then you get some sort of like residency I don't know what they call it where you're like yeah. you, you go up all the time at this particular venue and then you know maybe you get invited on you know Letterman or whatever and then you get maybe a sitcom and then you get maybe a movie and so on you know it's like right. there's a, there's there's a, track. a trajectory yeah. Um, same thing with musical artists and so on but for poets there's no, there's no track there's no way to there's no poetry like superstars or whatever you know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing mm -hmm. so uh, deaf poetry was essentially the next level for us it was like it. it was it was opening the you know the glass ceiling and it was like an opportunity to do something on a national level on national and that television. was the brainchild of russell simmons. yeah russell simmons russell yeah was, simmons. yeah okay and so yeah it was a really big deal for us he took it on broadway they won a tony you know it was it was yeah really a powerful moment for us in the poetry community so in the hip-hop poetry community in particular because it, it, it definitely had a hip-hop essence to it you know um uh, so I did that. So that fast, was 2004. 2004 and 2005. I was yeah. on two seasons of it. Mm -hmm. um, so fast forward some 10 years later, because I always had my, a, a mind, <clears throat> an idea that it's it's dope bringing these poets from all over and, and putting them on the stage and for them to present. But it would be something to go to where the poets are and hear their poetry in their environment. Uh, after I did Deaf Poetry, I started being, I started doing a lot of traveling. I started doing poetry full time yeah. uh, around the country and then I would start going abroad. And so over those 10 years, I had been, you know, to I don't know, countless different countries and whatnot. And, um, and I was seeing poetry in all these different places. And so 10 years later, I come back to Russell like, hey, I got this idea called Cornerstone Folklore uh, where we look at poetry and how it engages cultures around the world, you know? Okay. He was like, I love it, but I don't want to pay for it. So <laughs> uh -huh. so he had a deal with uh, with HBO, and so we went to HBO to pitch the idea, okay. and they loved it, gave us the money, and we went and, and, and shot, and that episode was in Iran, the pilot episode. Even when I heard the name, I was fascinated, and so unpack the name, because I think there's a lot of meaning there. Corner Store Folklore. folklore. So, yeah. I mean, there's a rhyme, so there's certainly <laughs> yeah. that. But the but the role of the corner store, yeah, in a neighborhood. So corner store folklore has a, a couple meanings. Yeah. One, it's a, a poem. The very f it's ah. the title track and the first poem that I recorded. It's okay. called corner store folklore. Okay. Also, what it means in this context is that the corner store representing. That's bad idea on my part not to know that. So I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. almost no one knows okay, that. Okay. I literally don't even know where to find the CD anymore. This was <laughs> okay. I recorded this whole album between uh -huh. Esha and Fajr because I couldn't afford to uh, to record, so I had to do the whole album in one stretch because my uncle let me use the studio while no one was in there. And so, <laughs> okay. so it, it's it's that yeah. old, and like okay. I said, I don't even have. I, I'm sure it's somewhere, but I don't even know where to find a copy of this CD. So. Um, uh, and so, but what it represents in the context of the show is the yeah. corner store being a um, a, a place of kind of communion um, yeah. and communities, uh, and so it's, I, I use that language to make it very colloquial, very um, um, communal, mm -hmm. you know. And then the folklore is um, represents almost a a, a kind of uh, mystical fabled yeah. element of how we see ourselves and how we describe ourselves and that's really what what poetry is you mm -hmm. know it's taking um kind of extreme language uh for lack of a better term right now but not normal language but pushing the boundaries of language to describe our experience or our people's experience or history or our hopes for the future or whatever so that's what corner store folklore represents so it's like let me go to all the corner stores around the world and see what they're talking about what kind of folklore are they creating in japan and mm -hmm. addis and uh and you know wherever so <clears throat> uh so we went and I wanted to do our pilot episode in Iran. And uh, because Iran's 
I mean, the, the in the Persian language, I mean, the poetry is, right. yeah, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, Rumi, Hafez, you know, uh, Faradin Latar, you know, so, uh, actually, I don't think Faradin Latar wrote in Farsi. Anyway, the point is, an extremely beautifully developed uh, uh, poetry tradition, and I chose Iran because most Americans don't know that. You know, they, they don't associate Iran with, poetry That's and right. especially love poetry which is all that the poetry mm. really is mm. love poetry and um spiritual poetry the, the mix of the two that's uh, I, I mean I, I would probably say like 90 percent of right. what the poetry is it's not as much even in america the poetry that i find uh popular you know is more politically charged than I found Iranian poetry to be, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so anyway. No, and it's fascinating. I mean, you, you you took this trip months ago, but now we're, as we're recording right now today, you know, we've got tensions flaring between exactly. the two countries. I mean, Trump almost what, ordered a strike like literally less than 48 hours ago. Um, and then, and then, you know. and then took credit for not starting World War III. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. Right. And this guy. <laughs> this, this freaking guy. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so you chose Iran for those reasons, yeah. and, and and was that your first trip to Iran? Or uh, it was it was my second trip okay. to Iran. I was invited uh, the first time, actually, because of a poem, actually, which was the second project that I wanted to mention. You're doing a great job at this. <laughs> this is a great, great parlay into the other one. Yeah. So uh, there's a there's a poem that I'm writing, an epic poem that I've been writing for for nine years now. It's in its tenth year, and uh, called the Lover, the Love, and the Beloved, and it's uh, an epic uh, love poem. Uh, about love and about the Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's uh, so anyway that I heard about this you one, read a portion of that at the hub Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. I yes, saw yes, a portion yes, of it yes. there, right. So if you're taking a request today, I mean, if you want to close this out with that, I wouldn't I, I, I wouldn't exactly be disappointed. So. <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> Not that anything you would you, you would do would be disappointing, but yeah. I appreciate exactly. it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I will. And, um, <clears throat> and so they yeah. had... Um, um, translated it and actually it was it was just the the prelude it wasn't yeah. actually the full the full poem uh they translated it and published it and and first which was a big honor for me as a as a as a, a, a um as someone who just really looks up to the to the they're serious about poetry you know right. and so they invited me to an event uh a conference there to talk about uh poetry and 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 my tradition of of poetry which is hip hop so i went and and gave a presentation and um and uh in the audience was uh was uh, a man who had the he was the host of the biggest uh television show in the country and so he was like i want you to come on my show you know right. uh his name is nada and his last name is uh slipping me right now so anyway i go on his show and uh <laughs> Um, so we're talking about like we're doing now talking yeah. about my life and he's playing some of my poetry and hip hop from from the the internet and so on and we're talking so after one of the producers is like man this is a historic conversation that we had and I was like oh wow. you know I'm thinking yeah it was a nice conversation because like no um, we've never played hip hop over the airwaves in Iran before wow. it's illegal so <laughs> they never in the history of Iran played hip hop before and uh and I was like, yeah, maybe you should have told me that we were going right. to start the revolution. You know, I'm in Argo mode trying to get into international airspace before this thing hits the press. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Great, so, great reference. Great reference. So, yeah. You know your audience well with me and Zucky sitting across from me. Uh, uh, so, sorry. Uh-huh. So, uh, so anyway, I go back to my, oh, but I asked him, I was like, yeah, should, yeah. I, should I be worried? Like, that's just kind of a, ever in the history of Iran, this is a big deal. Right. And he said, no, um, the amount of love that's in it, I think we're going to be okay, mm. which is amazing. The mm. belief in the power of love that he had, it was a little more than mine because I was still scared. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I go back to my hotel and the next day I'm supposed to be going to the it's city. It's like, I believe, but I still tie my camels, <laughs> exactly, man. You exactly, know? <laughs> tie, tie so I, Power of love, I'm all there, but <laughs> right, you know, yeah. can I book my flight? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Can I get an escort? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. So I go back to my hotel and uh, the next morning I have a meet and greet in the city of Qum uh, with some fans there and whatnot. So 
I'm up the next morning getting ready to go and I get a call in my um, hotel room from the organizer of the conference and he's like, uh, we had to cancel your trip to Coom. You've been invited to a meeting with the Supreme Leader. Come down and have breakfast. There's a vehicle waiting for you outside. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Even the Supreme Leader, it sounds like yeah. <laughs> Star Trek or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So... Uh, so you know, I go down. It ends up being um, uh, I have breakfast. We go to the to to the to the the, the White House. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember what they call the the place where the Supreme Leader is. Correct. And uh, so we, it, it's an event. It, it's um, uh, one of the memorial events for one of their uh, battles, big battles with yeah. Iraq. Uh, but anyway, one of the Ayatollahs who were there, who was responsible for the conference, um, says that um, you know, from what he learned about hip hop that he wants to write a fatwa to make hip hop legal in Iran and uh and for me to do the first uh hip hop festival in wow. Iran. Right. And this is like an example of what I mean about um a power of culture and the power of language cuz I'm not going there trying to fight for hip hop's rights I, you know hip hop me I'm not there as a political person I'm right. not there as an academic person I'm not there uh, as, Even as an activist, yeah, I mean, as you're an there activist, as an artist, yeah, I'm just there yeah. as a, as a poet, which is right. another way of saying I'm right. I'm there as a lover, of you course. know, yeah, and beautiful. so I'm just uh, engaging them sincerely with an open heart, and um, so there were just openings and openings there, and you and you can even see in the in the pilot for the show, yeah. you know, other openings where people are just allowing me into spaces that that are normally uh, closed off, and it was just it was just a lot of uh, a lot of love, but so that uh, was the my first trip to Iran, and then the next, then I knew I wanted to go back and shoot the pilot um, in Iran. So this corners of folklore and the poem uh, that I was writing then and and finishing now are the two, uh, you know, two of the major projects that I'm that I'm looking to complete. So, and then uh, have you recorded anything else beyond the trip to Iran then as part of the show? No. Okay. So we're just uh, shopping yeah. that pilot and seeing where it's going to live. And then, you know, if it lives Netflix or Amazon or wherever. Right. And then, you know, from there we'll have the budget to be able to go and shoot. So the, those conversations are ongoing. I imagine even if there's something, you know, about to blossom, you can't really speak to it right. here. Uh, but would, would, would listeners be able to hopefully see something in the next... Six months, a year, maybe. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't, and not okay. only because I am um, not allowed to say right. it's really up in the air. Okay. So we we'll see. It could you know I could get yeah. a call tomorrow, uh -huh. and it's like eh, it's on and popping. Um, but uh, even with that green light, you know the travel and the shooting and the editing, yeah. and you know I mean right. as you guys uh, know, you know it's uh, well. It, I saw the pilot or what you showed us showed of the pilot, um, and it was or it was a trailer for the pilot, right? Mm -hmm. It was it was a sizzle, yeah, was, yeah was like it? a sizzle, Sorry. like a short version of the pilot, a sizzle mm -hmm. of the pilot, and I was blown away by the production quality and just I mean what you've been able to capture. So yeah, it's um, it's a big blessing, and uh, it's an ambitious project because yeah. when you mention some of the other cities that you hope to visit, countries and cities. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very ambitious. Yeah, yeah, well. we're gonna jump around the world, man. And and uh, our production company, True and Living, and my my brother Mikael directed uh, that piece. My mm. older brother was producer on it, and so you know, this is our family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our, our production company, True and Living, and um, we just have ideas of what we want to be presented in the world, and we figure if we can do it with excellence, it'll just be yeah. undeniable. You know, right. that even people that aren't fans of our ideas still have to acknowledge that you know this is a you know a worthwhile you know cultural content you know right um and then and then and then the sort of opus you've been working on for the last 10 yeah, years what? yeah so that's a that's a, a book so it'll okay. be published in a, in a in a book form it's also a film and it's also an album so wow. that poem is going to have uh several uh manifestations for it and so we're uh just looking for folks that want to be involved in it you know as as investors or as producers or you know so we're galvanizing now that the poet the poem is what it is we're putting in together the pieces and we have a great team so far uh the, to put together the film uh for example actually we're going to shoot most of it in california wow uh that's one of the reasons i'm here actually oh, okay uh, 
So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, because usually when when you visit the bay, it's like you're you're here and then you're gone tomorrow morning. Yeah, so, so yeah. The, the fact that you were here for a, a few weeks yeah. and we were able to schedule this was 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 was, was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's a blessing. Um, so, where can maybe people find out about the, the the like like that project in particular, especially if they wanted to you know either invest or they have people in mind who might be interested in? Where yeah. can people find out about it? Um. Actually, if because um, it's not something that I've as far as the details of it that I've okay. like, really uh, uh, broadcasted, but they can reach me on any of the uh, the social networks and on all the social networks. It's just my name. Like for example, uh, the one I use most is Instagram and uh, Facebook, and that's just a good place just to know what's going on with me in general. You know, as far and, as and where is that? On that yeah. uh, at Amir Suleiman. Okay. So uh, A M I R S U L A I. M A N, and you can DM me there, or you can inbox me on Facebook. Uh, again, the same spelling uh, yeah. of the name, or Twitter, or whatever. Um, yeah, so we're 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 open and we're uh, optimistic and excited, you know, about this chapter. It's been so much stuff that's been um, being cultivated. So now we're approaching like harvest season. So you know, things over years. You know, mm. it's like now. This world can, I mean, Corners of Folklore has been years. Like that conversation yeah. with Russell Simmons was like 2016, wow. so I was 15. Right, so right. having this thing that I know is so wonderful and I know so many people enjoy uh, in this poem, likewise, for nine years, you know, and yeah. now it's finally gonna go out into the world it's, a yeah, true, it's, a true labor, as yeah, it were, yeah, a true labor real. of love, and you've been carrying this. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, um, you know, Godspeed to bring it to the masses. Thank um, you, my brother. So again, back to that request. If you could, get, you know, close this out um, with, uh, you know, something you'd like to share. Yes. Um, actually, I have uh, um, a bunch of different uh, poems uh, floating around in my mind. So what I'm going to do in yeah. these last few minutes is just uh, do it like a medley. Sure. We're honored. We're honored. Yeah. Um, uh, she asked, what does it feel like when a poem comes out? I said, it's like I'm writing my insides out, and I got to get it out before my pen dries out, before my ego finds out. Can't let my ego find out. Because when I'm writing my insides out, my every fear, my every flaw flies out. In my ego, where those fears and flaws hide out. So whatever I do, can't let my ego find out. She asked, where is the truth hidden? I laughed, not because she asked, but because as I'm living, I'm learning that the truth is hidden everywhere. Literally everywhere. There is no place you can scour, search, or visit except the truth is in it. The truth is hidden, even in the question, where is the truth hidden? In truth, the truth isn't hidden. It can't be hidden. It is the true and living. Those that are seeking to hide the truth try to convince me and you that they hid it, but they didn't. It is not that the truth isn't being spoken. Perhaps we are not ready to listen. Certainly we are not ready to listen. You may be at home in my poem, and if not, you may just visit. And if you can't visit, maybe you shouldn't listen. My poetry is not for everyone. It's no navy blue Yankee fitted. In fact, it's highly acidic enough to burn through the mind of a critic. Why be a cynic? When we're moving beyond the speed of light, there is no difference between time and distance. Such I'm both here and there in the same instant. For instance, I'm both man and infant both devil and angel. I'm both the witness and the witnessed, both monk and misfit. I'm the medicine in this sick. And if you would like to know what the truth is, I wrote the answer, which is the axis of the seven senses. And I told sis, hold this close to your heart until your soul sits still when the summer solstice. She said, I can't keep my soul still. It's hard to hold my focus. She said, I've noticed that I can't seem to focus on any real goals. I can only focus on what's closest. She said, how do you know what your goal is? I said, I don't. How does one save the souls of the soulless? An eviction notice stapled to the heart of the heatless, souls left homeless, no place to reside in, so they hide out and slide in the bodies of two-eyed men. So my lyricism is an exercise in exorcism, but the exoteric call it esoterism. I learned jihad from Rumi. The Sunni call me Shia, the Shia call me Sufi. The feds say I have WMDs from what I do with the loose leaf, because what I do with the loose leaf make devils lose sleep. My heart won't think, but my mind refuses to feel. So it needs me, leaves me senseless, sleepless, restless, wandering, wondering. I only come to my senses between sentences, and a sentence ends without a period point, or without a point, period. My point seem hollow, like hollow points, fired at point blank range that would crack my brain like my brain on crack. I'm somewhere between sane and black, stressed and brown. I'm a milky mulatto. 
passing the city of the living, passing and pretending as if I haven't died already. And I say I'm all ready to do it again because I'm a man of my word and a man of my worth and a man of the earth. I come from her and I'll return to the dirt, commune with the worms, just can't let it take a turn for the worse by passing and pretending until I really believe that I'm living and haven't died already because I'm a man of my word and a man of my worth and a man of the earth. And she will find me and pull me to her bosom until I can neither breathe nor speak, see nor blink, dream nor think. I think I'm dreaming of a vanilla sky and a chocolate earth and a calm out girl that sings when she speaks with perfume in her walk, her body transparent but how sincerely we talk. We'll take long walks in gardens with rivers flowing beneath. What was old and grieved is now new and sweet, like sweet sweat was swept off of our feet, like soul solaced in the sanctuary of God, and the precious presence of unspeakable beauty. The precious presence is present, past and future, and is past time, past space time, passed away, never to come again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, so on earth I am missing heaven, so on earth I fear not my end, I fear not of men. My heart won't think, but my mind refuses to feel, while you are the sun at noon, you are the calf in the noon, you are the bat in the seen in the seen and unseen. You are a shoreless sea. You are a nightless day. You are the meaning of being with the angels we pray. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima Ugli kawa khawatim lima Sabakana surah haq wal haq wal had ina surah taka mustakimu ala Ali haqa kajrihi wa migdal al I gained your love and then I lost my mind. What a bargain. I love you impossibly. I trade my eyes to see you. I trade my limbs to hold you. I love you impossibly. I'm loving you more than I can. Loving you, I am more than I am. I love you impossibly. When I'm dying of thirst, you are water. When I'm drowning to death, you are breath. For you are the sun at noon. You are the calf in the noon. You are the bat in the seen in the seen and unseen. You are a shoreless sea. You are a nightless day. You are the meaning of being with the angels. I pray, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima ugli kawa khatim lima sabakana surah haq wal haq wal had ina surah taka mustakim wa ala ali haqqa kajrihi wa mikdalihi al-adhim subhana rabbika rabbiz atama sifun wa salamu ala muslim wa alhamdulillah rabbin alameen Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. We are truly honored. Pleasure. Thank you for having me so honored. much. Thank you so much um, for having me. I guess, Zaki, uh, where can people find out uh, about the show and uh, find out and reach out to us? Yeah, please uh, hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. You can message us there. You can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. And uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you once again to our guest, Amir Suleiman. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you next time.